Journalists around the world are frequently detained, kidnapped and even killed for simply reporting the news. In the past 30 years, 1,400 have died and most of those responsible for their deaths have gone free. So how can this be changed? Well, a collective of advocacy groups has come together in The Hague to raise awareness. But will it be enough to turn this around? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Three press freedom groups are leading the fight to bring justice to journalists killed for simply doing their job. They've launched what they call the People's Tribunal on the Murder of Journalists in The Hague to name and shame offenders. It doesn't have the power to punish anyone or to sentence perpetrators, but it does have the ability to raise public awareness and collect evidence to support investigations into abuses. Its legitimacy comes from the involvement of some of the world's top legal experts and journalists. Survivors directly affected by the crimes, including relatives and colleagues of murdered journalists, will be given a platform to make their case. Well, the People's Tribunal on the Murder of Journalists will span a six-month time frame. It'll involve five hearings. The final one will be in May next year. The panel consists of nine judges, and the lead prosecutor is a renowned human rights lawyer, Almudena Bernabal. An indictment contains charges against the governments of Sri Lanka, Syria and Mexico, along with survivors of abuse. Leaders in the fight for press freedom would also give their testimony. Well, some of those include this year's Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Maria Ressa. She'll speak about the threats that she's faced as a journalist in the Philippines. So, lots to discuss with our guests, but first, a report from Al Jazeera's Step Varsen, who's been at that tribunal in The Hague. The People's Tribunal for the Murder on Journalists is held here in a church in The Hague, and this is a story close to our heart, because many journalists know a colleague, a friend, who was uh, killed or murdered for doing their job. In my case, this is uh, Dutch uh, journalist Sander Tunis, who was murdered in 1999 in East Timor, and investigators found that the perpetrators belonged to the Indonesian military, but nobody was ever brought to trial. Here's just one example, and it's said that eight out of ten cases are never being brought to uh, justice, so the organizers of the tribunal say killing a journalist is basically the safest crime. So to uh, fight this impunity. They have organized this tribunal. It has no legal powers. There will be no arrest warrants, but there will be a judge, there will be prosecutors, there will be witnesses. And this is very important for the cases, the so-called cold cases for witnesses to be able to testify in court in this, in this room here to, for their stories to be heard. So three uh, cases are being uh, focused on here during this tribunal. It's the murder of La Santa um, Vika Matunga, a Sri Lankan journalist who was murdered in 2009. Uh, we have Nabil al Sharbaji, it's a Syrian uh, journalist who was killed in military detention in 2015. And Miguel Angel Lopez, he was murdered with his wife and his son in Mexico. And Mexico is seen as one of the most dangerous countries uh, for journalists. Increasingly, journalists are being under attack. In recent years, more crimes have been committed and it's not only in war situations but more and more investigative journalists are being murdered for revealing corruption cases for doing anything that people in power might not like and that's also one of the reasons organizers say this impunity is continuing because very often it's our people who are part of the state part of the government part of the army who are responsible in total more than 1400 uh, murdered journalists, many of them cold cases, are, test, are recorded by the organi organizers of the tribunal. The tribunal will last around six months and there will be some kind of verdict at the end of it. Step Fasten for Inside Story from The Hague. So let's bring in our guests for today's discussion from The Hague. We're joined by Leon Willems, who's uh, director of Free Press Unlimited and founder of A Safer World for the Truth Project, that's uh, behind the tribunal, from Valletta in Malta. Uh, Karine Vela is the sister of Daphne Caruana Galicia, 
and member of the Daphne Caruana Galicia Foundation. And from Oxford in the UK, Julie Pozzetti, who is uh, Global Director of Research at the International Centre for Journalists. Welcome uh, to Inside Story, all of you. Uh, Leon, let's start uh, with you. Uh, what is the point of this tribunal when it doesn't have the power to punish anyone or hold to account any perpetrator? I think that the People's Tribunal is, uh, good afternoon by the way, the, the People's Tribunal is an attempt to seek justice. Uh, more than 1,400 journalists have been killed since 1992. That means that 1,400 stories have been killed. It means that 1,400 relatives and family members have, left, have been left with a spot of uh, emptiness in their soul. And we need to seek justice. And the reason that we're doing this at the grassroots attempt uh, at the People's Tribunal is basically because states are not living up to their responsibility to protect journalists and to investigate uh, duly uh, what happens when a journalist is murdered. So it's really uh, promoting a better uh, standard for seeking justice uh, giving recommendations for better investigations and highlighting and documentation some of the graphic cases of injustice that have happened uh, in, the, in the past years. That is the objective. And we believe it will have an impact. You think so? You think that, that, that states will feel pressured by this, shamed into doing something about it? Well, I think that uh, one of the things we're hoping for is that uh, the international uh, jurisdiction is improved. Uh, at the moment, we see that many of the cases of murder journalists are uh, prosecuted as a case of a normal murder, whereas it is our conviction and actually the evidence that we are presenting to the People's Tribunal judges uh, is showing that uh, in most cases, more than 900 of the 400, 1,400 cases, journalists were actually killed for the stories that they were writing. This is neglected in most judicial processes. So there's, there's much to improve, and we believe that the recommendations will help. Of course, um, in the case of the Syrian Arab Republic, uh, one of the cases that we are bringing to highlight to the uh, tribunal, we don't expect them to change their behavior. But the international jurisprudence, the quality, the best practices of prosecuting better investigations, that is what we can promote, and we can actually show that it's possible to investigate these cases. That is what the safer world for the truth is all about. All about. Corinne, uh, given what happened to your sister, why do you think this tribunal is so important? It's because, uh, good afternoon, by the way, it, it is important for multiple reasons, as Leon Williams has already explained. It raises awareness, it forces people to think, it might not get states to do what they should be doing, but it is certainly focusing attention where it should be. Uh, Leon uh, spoke about the number, total number of journalists that has been killed. When you look at it in detail, it's even more frightening. Every week a journalist is killed. That's every single week of the year. Think of how many stories are lost. Think of how many people are left in distress. Think of how much is being covered up. The important thing about the tribunal it is, is that it's focusing responsibility where it should be. States should be protecting journalists. They should not be protecting the people who killed them. Has the situation in Malta changed since Daphne's murder? Could what happened to Daphne happen again there? Nothing has been done to change the systems that failed her. So the situation now is as possibly even more precarious than it was before Daphne was killed. Because up to Daphne's murder, we knew that it was a possibility. Now we know definitely that it can happen. Julie, just to play devil's advocate for a moment, should journalists working in areas where international law and local legislation, if it even exists, is not implemented, uh, should they understand that theirs is, is a risky profession? That if you're going to expose corruption, uh, wrongdoing, organised crime, incompetence, you're going to upset people. You're going to make enemies. In fact, it's your job to speak truth to power and inevitably that results in making enemies, particularly if it's a case of investigative reporting into corruption, uh, into organised crime, into environmental crimes. Um, it, naturally, uh, there is risk attached to this and that's why I think uh, shining a light on the murder of journalists with impunity and the general culture of impunity when it comes to attacks on journalists 
um, in an event like the one uh, that, that is being staged in The Hague is important because a large part of the battle is actually getting citizens around the world to recognise that when you kill or mute a journalist through attacks, you are killing stories and you are killing the public's right to know who is abusing power, who is stealing from the public purse, um, who is inflicting harm on others. And it's important for people to understand, um, as, as uh, Leon began, that um, this is a freedom of expression crisis. It's not just about individuals being murdered um, or threatened or harmed online or offline. Um, it's actually about attempts to prevent us as citizens knowing what we need to know to be able to make choices, whether it's about who to elect um, or how to protect ourselves from a pandemic. Julie, where are the deadliest places in the world to be a journalist right now? Uh, why is Latin America, Mexico, so dangerous in particular? Yeah. Well, Latin America um, is, is certainly a focus, um, Mexico indeed, uh, places like the Philippines, um, which remains one of the deadliest places on earth to practice journalists, uh, to practice uh, journalism. Um, Syria, indeed, um, the countries that are in focus uh, in this um, tribunal hearing. Um, it's a combination of um, corrupt, corrupt power. It's, and in, in the age of disinformation, it's also a case of undermining public trust in journalism, in journalists. I mean, you take somebody like Daphne in a place like Malta, which we did not necessarily think was one of the, the places on earth um, that it could be so dangerous to be a journalist. Um, and we see in this era, um, as the world really does tilt back towards fascism, we see that threats to journalists are not just happening in conflict zones like Syria, um, like Afghanistan, they're happening in Western Europe, they're happening um, in countries that we previously considered to be safe to practice journalism. And the reason that's occurring is because uh, there's been an enabling environment created um, by the rise of populism, by weaponized social media platforms, um, and the general threats to journalists whose job it is to ensure that we have access to truth has become that much more difficult and the demonization and the criminalization of journalism has caused an escalation of these threats. So it's no longer just about conflict and it's no longer just about um, understanding the threat being elsewhere in the context of despotic states or countries that are beset by organized crime. It's increasingly um, a case of um, emboldened uh, political leaders um, and uh, corporations and corporate actors feeling um, safe to attack journalists and that we have to change. You raise some extremely interesting points there. We'll come back to you, uh, Julie, to talk more about that in, in just a few moments. But, but first, uh, Leon, tell us more about the three cases in particular that this tribunal... I know, I know it's, it's, it's very broad, it's, it's not just going to take in these three cases, but it is focusing on three cases in particular. Tell us more about those. Well, um, uh, today we are hearing uh, graphic evidence from a number of uh, celebrity cases. But for us, the objective was also to look at places far away that normally don't have the public eye. So one of the cases we're bringing to the judges is the case of La Santa Rica Matunga. Uh, it's a journalist uh, who was heading a media outlet in Sri Lanka. And it was during the civil war that uh, he was one of the critics of the government policy that was leading to the killing of innocent citizens. And because of that, uh, a social media campaign and uh, threats were made uh, by government officials. And, and one of them, graphically, is the brother of the current president of uh, uh, Sri Lanka. So we have this selected this case because there's really no chance that there will be uh, a real trial happening in Sri Lanka today. That is why we bring it to this international forum. Uh, similarly, in the case of uh, uh, Nabil al Shabaji, one of the founders of Ainal Baladi, Sons of the, of the Village, uh, a very important Syrian media outlet, independent media outlet, was killed in custody in Syria uh, in 2015 after two years of back and forth in prison. He was tortured. One of the important aspects of the um, International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights, the Human Rights Charter that we know, is that people should be protected from torture in this case, clearly, there has been torture. 
Uh, moreover, the Syrian authorities have failed to respond to any kind of accusation that was made against him. So clearly another case where you cannot expect local justice to happen. Um, the last case that we are investigating is Miguel Velasco. He was a journalist in Veracruz, Mexico, and uncovering a drug-related crime in which in Mexico, one of the problems is, uh, especially in Veracruz, one of the most deadliest provinces of Mexico. Um, Miguel was uh, investigating crimes of drugs uh, mafia, which was connected to the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the upper world. So people indicted, uh, or not indicted, but people uh, that he blamed for being complicit in uh, the, the criminal acts of the drugs mafia were connected to the local government um, high officials. So again, uh, although we believe that there may be an, an ob object for bringing it to the federal prosecutorial level, we do not expect that in Mexico this case will be uh, further processed. Right. So apart from that, so these are the three cases where it's clear that the level of impunity, we cannot expect to have more local action on this. Yes. In fact, in Save a World for the Truth, we've also investigated 10 other cases in which there is a possibility for local action. For example, we investigated the death of Zabari Mujahid in Pakistan, um, and we found in our investigation new evidence which uh, has allowed the family and lawyers to reopen the case in Pakistan. So what we're trying to do is use every avenue to create justice, because in the end of the day, all these people deserve their day in court. They deserve to be heard, something that is not happening today. Kareen, where are you on the road to justice for, for Daphne? Uh, one man has been, has been sentenced to prison. At least here, we have had a, a case brought to, to court after pleading guilty of involvement. But what's, what's happening now? Mm -hmm. Well, seven people have admitted to Daphne's murder or are being processed because of, you know, on charges for murder. So, as you said, one person's been in prison because he pled guilty. Two others are resisting trial by putting spokes in the wheel. A third person who's been accused of commissioning Daphne's murder has been indicted. He, too, pleads innocence. And two further people have been arraigned. They are pleading innocent as well. They are accused of supplying the weapon. Uh, earlier this year, a public inquiry into Daphne's murder, into circumstances of Daphne's murder closed, and there were recommendations. But three months later, we're still waiting to see any action taken towards, you know, redressing the balance. You know, there were clearly problems within state institutions. The state was, it was found to be held responsible for Daphne's murder, even though it wasn't found to be guilty of commissioning the murder. That, but those failures, the failures that led to Daphne's murder, have not been redressed. And we're still working towards that. And, and what, is the, what is the state saying when, when, when that is raised with them? What, why is it taking so long? I would imagine, I'm not taking a guess here, I would imagine that the larger principle is being subordinated to political expediency. Any political decisions that have to be taken to, to fix things that rotted for so long are necessarily going to upset a lot of people mm. and are seen to be inconvenient. I would imagine that is the problem. But the urgency remains. You know, international NGOs are literally on the case. There was a mission here on the fourth anniversary of Daphne's murder. And the, the mission met with the head of police, met with the head of government, met with journalists. And uh, they recognise the situation for what it is. It remains problematic. Julie, coming back to what you were saying a, a few moments ago, we live in an era of disinformation and, and fake news. Yeah. To what extent are online platforms aiding and abetting violence against journalists at the moment? It's a very significant function um, that they are playing, in fact, to facilitate uh, or to be victors for violence against journalists. Um, the most stark example I can give you um, to illustrate this point is that it was only a couple of weeks ago that Facebook decided that it was not OK to threaten to murder a journalist on the platform, um, which is extraordinary. Up until that point, to reflect what Leon was saying earlier about the murder of journalists with impunity being a special case, 
The justification Facebook gave for failing to act in such cases was that journalists draw attention to themselves, their public figures, and therefore they should expect to be abused. Well, online violence, which is particularly virulent against women journalists, um, where you see a blend of networked misogyny and viral disinformation um, and, and other forms of hate speech, such as racism intersecting uh, on a platform like Facebook or any number of other um, digital platforms, you see that that creates an enabling environment. It aids and abets um, crimes against journalists because it creates almost a, a, a sort of tide um, of abuse which can be triggered by uh, political actors um, but it's and fueled by political actors, but it also is amplified via algorithmic um, abuse, if you like, in such a way that it can um, embolden those who hurl threats and hurl um, sexist abuse uh, against women like Daphne Caruana Galizia, who was herself brutally uh, trolled uh, and threatened with murder and sexual violence before her death. To, to these so, are real threats, yeah, and, I, and they're also part of the impunity problem. Yeah, so so what, what needs to happen to stamp it out? Well, I mean, the first thing is, I think, um, where there uh, are laws against hate speech, um, they can be used against women journalists only if misogyny um, is recognised as a hate crime or a form of hate speech. So that's a really important. Secondly, um, with, when it comes to the platforms, um, as we've recommended uh, myself and colleagues researching online violence uh, for UNESCO and the International Centre for Journalists, um, looking at cases such as Maria Ress's, for example, the Nobel Peace uh, Prize winner, um, we have recommended that the onus needs to be shifted from the women being attacked to the platforms facilitating the abuse and the perpetrators. And so there needs to be, you know, much more stringent action taken. And perhaps this should be um, enacted in reference to one of our other findings, which is that from a survey of women journalists, 20% had experienced offline attacks and abuse and harassment that they linked to online violence episodes. So there's a direct correlation between online attacks and offline attacks. And that is extremely disturbing in an environment um, such as the one we're inhabiting. Leon, when so many have literally got away with murder for so long, why should anything change now, particularly when so many governments around the world still see journalists as a problem? Look, I think that we have to realise as a general public, but also as journalists working together, that the reason why journalists are more and more targeted is because our institutions are weakening. We see a decline of the independence of the judicial apparatus around the world. Uh, presidents, politicians are taking charge of the judiciary system. So we need to stand up towards that. We believe that the fact that journalists are targeted more and more and more is partly because they're the last resort for uh, investigating crimes that are happening. Journalists perform an extremely important public function because they uncover with their stories the wrongdoing that is happening in all of our societies, uh, left, right, and center. And uh, because journalist is not about policing, but asking questions that are critical, that is a role that journalists have traditionally. And we need that institution to be protected by the institutions that are guaranteeing us independence. So for me, the question, is not about whether or not journalists should ask these questions. The question is, why do we allow, as a public, as a general public, we allow ourselves to be engulfed in these um, spheres where journalists are criticized, et cetera, rather than supported? So we believe that solidarity is extremely important. We at Free Press Unlimited received more than 600 requests for journalists in danger last year. That was a duplication of the number the year before. Mm. This year we have Afghanistan, Burma, Nicaragua. We cannot just go on to protect and prevent. We have to get to prosecution. Okay. We have to strengthen our independent judiciary. There, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it. Uh, many thanks indeed to all of you, Leon Willems, uh, Corinne Vela and Julie Pussetti uh, for being with us today.
Uh, thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the programme again at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle at AJ Inside Story from me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you again. Bye for now.